be available. The slide deck will be available and sent out um, by the program area. And when I talk about program area, I mean developmental services. So it's just around 10 o'clock. I think we should get started um, so we can go through the material. And then um, if there are questions, um, please put them in the chat or um, unmute yourself to ask your questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I just want to start off with a few definitions first. Um, for those people that aren't as familiar with maybe the Medicaid enrollment process, um, this will give you an idea of some of the terms we're going to be using in the presentation. So when we talk about a provider, we actually mean a Medicaid enrolled entity that will be submitting claims for covered Medicaid services. The MMIS is our Medicaid Management Information System. That is where our claims um, are processed and adjudicated and payments are sent to the providers. An NPI is a National Provider Identification Identifier, excuse me, and it's a HIPAA required unique 10 digit identification number for all healthcare providers in the United States. Revalidation is a requirement from CMS that when you enroll with state Medicaid agency, you are required federally every five years to complete a re-enrollment application. We have a process for that through the MMIS that um, you know, is a streamlined process. So it's not that you have to complete the whole application at the revalidation, but there are certain components that you must enter into the application. Trading partner, that's a third party entity that enters into a business relationship with the Medicaid provider to complete transactions. They also must be enrolled with the MMIS and have completed authorizations from each provider entity to act on their behalf. And the LEIE, or the OIG, as some people know it, is a list of excluded individuals or entities. It's a database of the Office of Inspector General. There is a website that I'm going to give you, um, and it's a searchable database, and um, you do not have to enroll to use that database. So we're going to start right out with the provider enrollment. Um, each service location is required to be enrolled with a provider type and the new provider type that's being developed is developmental services. It's an online application and I've given you the uh, web address to find it. Um, it is all done through our portal of our MMIS system. And then there is opportunity to upload documents that are required for the enrollment. One particular note I want to state is that they are still working on putting in the new provider type of developmental services. So when you start your application, if you start it now, you will have to put in the provider type as other. Um, because we do not have the new one active yet in the MMIS. But we want to give the opportunity to providers that if you want to start now, um, we will be accepting applications after this presentation. Karen? Yes. I have a question. So Hello. if, if um, um, an agency does not want to bill, if they want to continue having the area agency on their behalf, do they still need to do this enrollment? Yes because you have to delegate that you're gonna have the um, area agency do your billing for you. That is my understanding. Now that could change. Um, hi, this, hi, Karen, this is Jen Doig. Um, thank, thank you for the question. So um, all providers that are currently providing 
uh, services to individuals in the developmental disability system have to become enrolled. Um, they will then be able to choose to either build a back office and direct bill themselves or choose to pay or hire a third party biller to do their uh, billing on their behalf. And that third party biller could be an area agency if they so choose to be a billing provider. So that's how it's gonna work um, going forward. Thank you, Jen. Um, did that answer your question? Were there any other questions? We've got I have a, hello, good morning. I have a question for Jen. So Jen, when you said that, um, when you reference as a provider, are you referring to the provider agency? All provide, yeah, all their vendors, provider yes. agencies are vendors currently okay. in the developmental system. There will no longer be vendors. You need to become enrolled as a Medicaid provider and go through the system that, um, you know, like Karen is talking about. And we do have an option to directly bill Medicaid uh, instead of going through yes. the agency. And Correct. You will have that option. I'm going to get into that option as we get Correct. through the application part. I've split that out on a slide for you so we can talk more about it at that time. Jen, I have a question. I have to just decline it. There we go. Okay. I, okay. I have a question. Jen, you just said that um, if we don't want to bill ourselves, we can pay another company to bill for us, and that company might be an area agency. So if they choose are, you to be, say, yes. are you saying that we're not going to have to pay the area agency? They won't do it um, as part of their dad's um, business? Uh, that, that's correct. So every, every provider will have the, the option to direct bill. They can do it themselves or have a, Karen, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a trading partner that yeah. they will list. So we're going to have to pay the area agency to bill for us if we don't want to bill ourselves. Yeah, which you currently are doing now with the budgets that you present because they keep a portion of the budget. Oh, okay. So, okay. But so it might be an extra charge. Well, the budget, the budget system will be, it'll be different the way a budget is developed because we'll be having rates. But you will be getting the rate that the state has set and then you will hire instead of negotiating a rate that is probably lower than what the state rate is and having them do it. Okay, thank you. So, so that is all gonna come out in our, when we do the next modeling. So I think today, we really want to dedicate it to, instead of talking about that, let's, let's listen to Karen and um, Conduit in how to enroll, because everybody has to enroll. So let's, let's work on, on that now, and, and uh, I'll let Karen do that. Hold the other questions, send them to Jess Kennedy um, after the meeting, and um, we'll, we'll collect them and we'll work on that. Um, at our next meeting and by the end of this month uh september beginning october we're going to start the modeling so more will come out with that okay okay thank you all right karen i'll, I'll let you go through why don't you just go through it and then we'll because okay. if you know we, we don't we just want to have let you have the time that you need so um as jen said in order to be um, an enrolled provider, there are some um, functions that you have to complete. So this is in order to get to bill and get paid for Medicaid covered services, however it is set up. And we'll go through that in a few slides. So a provider needs to complete the application online. And we gave you this list that needs to be included with that application. These are all forms that are found on the MMIS enrollment site. And it's a signed provider participation agreement. It's a signed application signature page. It's a copy of licensure if required for certain agencies. A copy of a signed W-9. 
an IRS verification letter, and a social security number verification. If you are going to be billing with a federal tax ID, you must complete the billing group application underneath that provider enrollment um, list. If you will be billing with your social security number, you must complete the billing individual application. Now, what I came up with a sample for that is if you have someone that is doing an environmental modification and they are a sole person, a sole individual that you are engaging a, a, an agreement with for them to provide a service for one of your Medicaid recipients, they may only have a social security number because they don't have a group FEIN number, tax ID. So that would be an instance that they would, you would have that person become enrolled. Um, and if that is a person that is going to be utilized to provide multiple services. And that was the distinction I was, I was trying to make between a group and an individual. All of the applications must include a 10-digit national provider identification number. And I get into how to do that in another slide. As well as, it's called a taxonomy that identifies the services that you're providing. We put a little note here about a best practice that when you are submitting your claims and you're using your NPI number, it, it is in the best interest to also include your provider ID as well. That way we can ensure that it's going to the appropriate entity. In the application process for a group provider, there are, there are sections that must be completed in order for us to move forward with the application. And one of them is the owner and managing employee section of the application. Now what this means is um, it's kind of confusing the way the questions are worded, but an owner of your entity. Is there a sole owner? Is there a shared ownership? Is there um, controlling interest in multiple owners? Or do you have a board of directors? That's the section that you would fill out under owner. If you are going to complete the managing employee section of the application, that means your day-to-day -day functioning people. Do you have an administrator? Do you have a chief executive officer? Do you have a chief financial officer? Those are classified as managing employees. And those also would have to be um, disclosed on the application. Um, that is so that we can do our federally mandated comprehensive screening. If we do not have that information on the application, the application is going to be stalled while we try to obtain that information from you. You also need to complete registration for web access. This allows the provider access. You can check eligibility of members, you can submit claims, and you can receive a remittance advice. The provider also must keep copies of appropriate service provider qualifications. That would be a licensure or documentation of credentials on file. This is for all non-enrolled staff so that they can be screened monthly by the provider, which is you, on the LEIE OIG exclusion site for any sanctions or exclusions. And I gave that presentation over a year ago to the area agencies about it is the responsibility of enrolled providers to check all of their staff on a monthly basis and maintain a copy that they are doing that screening in case of an audit um, that um, would be presented to you. All providers also are required to revalidate every five years as I said by completing a new application and submitting signature pages, and then we complete the screening. 
Now, if you are an enrolling group provider and you've given us the owner and the managing employees, we do the screening at the state and we do the monthly checks. That is how the state is functioning right now so that the provider is not burdened with doing all of those. So state will take care of that for you. Okay, here we are with the NPI. So the National Provider Identification Number is all individuals and organizations that meet the definition of a healthcare provider. Sorry, this is interrupting with my slide. As described at 45 CFR 160.103 are eligible to obtain a National Provider Identifier. These include health plans, health plan clearinghouses, health care providers who transmit health information electronically, and healthcare organizations that transmit protected health information to covered entities who require access to the protected health information. Basically, this is a part of HIPAA. And it is required that you have that MPI number um, and that you use it on your claim submissions. NPES is the National Plan and Provider Enumeration System. That is where an individual or organization must submit an application in order to obtain their MPI. There's also a website that you can go to to obtain or to check your NPI number. If you already have an MPI, this question came in prior to the presentation, and you are using an NPI for multiple services within your organization, that is the provider's um, right to choose an MPI that they desire to use. But when you're doing your claim submission, it is in your best interest to put your provider ID on your claim as well to ensure that the remittance goes to the correct um, entity that is, because there are some agencies that have multiple levels within their agency. And that just ensures that the remittance goes to the correct level that you want. Now we have been doing a preliminary review of all service provider qualifications. And I did not have that completed for this um, training. That will have to come at a later date. We are categorizing services into specialties. Um, and it will identify qualifications that each provide, you know, that each specialty needs in order to have that specialty listed under your provider ID number. We have a mechanism within our MMIS that we can do that. So if you are providing multiple services, we have the ability to put those specialties underneath your provider number so that it does say that you're eligible to do those services. We've looked in the state plan and we are also looking in the administrative rules. And this is regarding the licensure requirements specifically. So at this time, in a preliminary look, it identifies that case management only providers may require a health facility license. And that is what our preliminary review has discovered for us. Now, we have not made a final decision on that yet, and we will be determining that and sending further guidance out from the department when that decision has been made. But that is the preliminary review about obtaining a license for case management only. Okay, here we go with claim submission and payments. So you've got your application done, and now you need to make a determination on your claim submission and payments. Excuse me one. In order to be paid electronically, you have to complete the enrollment application. Section four is the electronic funds transfer section of the application. And in order to do that, you have to submit the following documentation. An EFT agreement form, 
an EFT application form, and a bank letter or copy of avoided check. We've identified there are three ways that you can submit claims for payment. <clears throat> The first would be, you actually will have access to go into the MMIS portal. And with this process, the electronic claims are submitted directly into the portal and receive real-time adjudication. So you'll know if they've been um, accepted or not. Conduent does offer a group training session. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> or they can set up templates that you can use if you want to do this submission of claim. Sorry. There are three ways. The, excuse me, the second way is the vendor software. This is if your entity already has a third party vendor software that you use in your agency to submit your billing to other entities for payment. You may use that third-party vendor software to submit to Medicaid, but you must submit the following documentation. An electronic remittance advice application, and this is required for all 835 transactions, which is your remittance, and a trading partner signature page. Now I know it says trading partner there and you're gonna use the software, but the reason we have to have that trading partner signature page is we have to know what the software is that you're gonna be using and it has to be tested through the MMIS system so that we ensure that you have appropriate transactions going back and forth following the HIPAA regulations for those transactions. Trading partner. <clears throat> this is when you're using a third party billing agent the billing agent also needs to be enrolled. So if you are not using an area agency, but you are using another third-party billing agent, they will need to complete and, and be ed um, submitted and obtain a trading partner ID. It is a unique ID that they use, and they also have to submit the following documentation the electronic remittance advice, a billing agent agreement form, and a trading partner signature page. Now, the reason we require those is to make sure that the provider who wants to use this third-party billing agent or the vendor software, that we are aware of what you will be using. And it becomes uh, a part of your enrollment record and we also ensure that they follow the HIPAA regulations for that billing and that their um, interaction with our MMIS is, meets the guidelines that we have in a compliance guide. So they do have to usually go through some testing with the MMIS to make sure that there is no problems with them receiving um, remittances from the MMIS and us receiving claims. Karen, this is nope. Kathleen. Can I just interrupt for a minute? It, um, on the trading partner, that, that those forms are going to be submitted by the provider that is enrolling. Okay, so just so that you understand that in your enrollment, those can be uploaded in your enrollment, original enrollment. Those are the forms needed if you're using a trading partner. Okay, that was Kathleen Donovan. She's from Conduent. Um, and and we, those are that the provider themselves have to complete those um, forms that you're designating to the third party billing agent. Mm -hmm. um, if a provider determines not to continue with a trading partner, say that you change your mind and you do not want to continue that relationship, mm -hmm. a letter from the managing employee of the provider needs to be sent to MMIS informing of the change.
Karen, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, what was that? We couldn't hear you. I know, sorry. Um, so now um, I'll stop for a minute. Are there any questions up to that point? When is uh, this required to be done by? We have not set a final date yet. We are presenting this today and we do not want to hold back from providers if they want to start the process. So we are going to be able to start taking the applications um, when the providers are ready to start submitting. it. Would you be able to share uh, this PowerPoint with us so that we can reference it as we go through the process? Yes, as I said in the beginning, this slide deck is going to be available to everybody that is participating within this project. So even if you're not on the call, you will have an opportunity to have a copy of this. Thank you. Any other questions at this time? Uh, so I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so we do uh, early supports and services. We also do community-based services. So for example, we've got two different offices for the uh, early intervention. Uh, early supports, and then we have like three offices that do the community-based services. So does that mean I'm looking at making five new group IDs, or are they all going to be like, can we put five locations under one that is developmental services, or are we splitting them half early supports and then putting the CBS uh, under one? So Mark, according to the regulations, we can only put one location under one okay. application. All right. Um, so every location, we'd need an, an ID. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the NPIs, so can we, if we have existing NPIs, can we use them for, um, you know, like, so for example, our, our three uh, community-based services, can we use that same NPI for each location? Are you currently using that now? Well, we're not really even billing the CBS, but we are using, so for example, our early supports and services, we have uh, also like, so we have two outpatient IDs, one for each location. They use the, the same NPI mm -hmm. um, right now. And if we could keep that NPI and port it over to the, these new IDs, uh, I'm, I don't know if that's what we want to do, but I'm just posing the question. So I'm going to say that is a decision within your organization, how you want to handle your NPIs and your provider IDs. Um, we at the state level are not, we do not direct how you do that. We kind of tell you the pros and cons if you ask us the question. So if you use an MPI for all of the services that you're providing, it may be difficult determining what you're getting paid for. Okay. Um, and then another question. So for the community-based services, we have like residential, like uh, EFC housing, right? So there we have group homes and we have, you know, individual families that host uh, these clients. Are all of those going to be considered locations that require a, a group ID or are we, are those going to be sort of rolled into the, the office locations that are, are managing those? They're going to be rolled into the office location. Yes. Okay, that's great. That's specialty that we're going to put underneath that location. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I got for now. Thanks. You're welcome. Does anybody else have any further questions before we go on? <laughs> Just to clarify, mm -hmm. um, the each location will have to do a separate application. Yeah, if you have the the only way the MMIS can set up the provider ID is by one location. Um, we it is a challenge to set up multiple locations. We don't have the capacity to do that. I think prior in old versions or something, there was some different mechanisms, and I know Medicare sets it up um, differently than we do, but our system can't handle it. So we can't list multiple locations underneath a provider. So we have the main location and we have the service location. That's what it is on the application that you will see. 
So if you have a main office that's going to be doing your billing and your coordination and those types of things, that would be your main mailing address. But say your service location is um, at another address, you would have to list both. Mailing so, and service. Sorry. So we have offices, but we provide our services in people's homes for enhanced family care, adult foster care. So one office might serve 30 people, but the services are actually occurring in their homes. That's okay because you use the office address. The office would be your location address. Okay, thank you. Because you provide community. So you don't actually have another office. These are for people that have multiple offices throughout the state. Um, it's difficult to determine which office is which. And when I get into the screening requirements, there are some requirements that we consider we have to do, um, we have to follow for the federal regulations where we have to make a site visit. So we would have to know where we were going. So we have four offices throughout the state. So we would do an application for each office as a community provi provider of community services from that office. Um, that is the current status. If that changes, I will let you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that um, this will not occur this fiscal year, like in terms of turning over the billings and having, not the application, but the actual implementation? The application is going to happen this fiscal. I'm right. not sure about the other part. I'm not in, as involved in that, and maybe Jen can give you some timeline on that. But the reason we wanted to do this today is so that people have an opportunity to go in, look at the application, and start looking at and deciding how do you want to move forward with your services and be reimbursed. Am I accurate, Jen, on that? Did she drop off? <laughs> Jen just dropped off. I can touch base with her on that. Okay, Sandy, am I accurate on that? I'm sorry, Karen, say that one more time. Oh, okay. So the question was, they wanted to know if this was going to happen in this fiscal year, and I said that the application process is going forward in this fiscal year, but as far as the other determining factors for the um, billing components, um, we wanted everybody to have an opportunity to at least go forward and complete the application and get it in so we would um, be yes. ahead of ourselves. Yes, that, that is true. And, and keep in mind that um, the modeling, and we're still going to do that modeling, and that information we will take, and that could change some of what we are thinking at this point. So, you know, we, that's why we're doing the modeling. So stay tuned on that, but getting a head start on um, doing the, the um, getting your applications in, getting your provider numbers, becoming a Medicaid enrolled provider um, is, is to be done now, this year, yes. So, and, and it doesn't, as long as you start your application process and we get you screened and get you a number and everything, it, it's not uh, a written in stone application. You can always make changes down the line, especially to specialties and other things that are going to be assigned to you. We're going to be looking to the program area, the Department of Developmental Services to help with that because they all know what you are providing for services by service authorizations. So we are going to be looking for them to assist us with what specialties we're going to be assigning certain providers. So this is sort of a whole collaboration process with all of us going through trying to um, start this. So now, I, I have a question. Yeah. So if uh, a, vendor, uh, a, provide, a vendor agency were to uh, submit the billing directly, what, there, are, there are functions which the area agency does on behalf of the vendor agency in the current setup. Would that, what responsibility then falls on the vendor agency if they were to do direct billing? Um, if you are going to be an enrolled Medicaid provider and you're going to be doing the direct billing, then it solely is your responsibility to ensure that you are billing co the correct codes, the correct amount, and 
checking your remittance advice to um, see what exactly was paid for you, as well as providing your services, um, whether it be you include case management in that or just your services. So the case management, if we were to directly bill, then uh, the case management would not be there for us in that instance? That is, my understanding is, is that is a choice of the individuals in my true gen in that? Yes, individuals will have a choice. Mm -hmm. That's that's the corrective action plan, the conflict of interest. They will have a choice to um, have an independent or an area agency. If they choose an area agency to do their case management services, the case man, uh, the area agency cannot provide direct services to that one individual. So in, in, so in an event when uh, the vendor agency is directly billing Medicaid, uh, we would still have area agency if the, if the client were to choose area agency involved for case management. Yeah, that, that's correct. So, so they could, they could, right, they could choose an area agency to do their case management, but now you are a, a Medicaid provider, a standalone entity providing a service, so it's no longer a conflict. Correct, but uh, our understanding was, um, you know, the percentage which the area agency gets out of an individual budget pays for case management. Uh, would we have to then pay the area agency for case management? So, the way the system is going to work with direct bill, there's a rate. So the rate based on the service agreement so the budget template as we know it will no longer be service agreement will direct where the services go. So that case management, so they're gonna choose um, Lakes Region to do their case management, making this up. Here's the, here's the rate for case management. That's what that individual will be getting. Then for you, the service that they provide for you, that will be Part of a PA that'll be a line item on the PA and what level it is that's the rate you get that's based on our rate table and that's what you get for the number of units that you request and what what the service agreement um, determines that that individual needs. Jen this is Anna Lake my understanding is this does not apply to early supports and services or to um, early supports vendor programs at the area agency. Hi, Anna. Um, which doesn't apply? Um, becoming a service Medicaid coordinator or... conflict of interest because that service that is correct provided right within the scope of that's ESG. correct. It, it's the the conflict of interest. The corrective action plan is with CMS and our waivers. ESS is not a waiver program. Um, it is a Medicaid program. It's not a Medicaid waiver program. So, um, but providers of ESS should enroll as a Medicaid provider. Is every program type going to have a rate? In other words, enhanced family care will be a rate, group home will be a rate, day hab will be a rate. We currently have a slate of rates for day hab. We yeah. have six, we have six rates right. in the DD system um, for um, but enhanced family care is budget based on the individual as our well, most residential setups. That, that, that's true. And so we will be shifting. Jen, uh, this, Jen, this is Lori Vashon. Enhanced family care won't have a separate rate from a staff. What we pay for are residential services and the level of care of those residential services are the rates, not how they're implemented. So I want to be careful about that. So the, there's, there's rates for residential services, but not necessarily a special rate for shared family living versus staff. It's a residential rate depending on the needs of the individual and how that those services are provided depends on the individual and the team. Thank you, Lori. Yes, that is true. So how many rates do you anticipate since needs are very varied? 
Uh, is it high level need, medium level, level need? Is it behavior, diagnosis? We are still working that through. Um, and we will be using area agencies as well as our internal staff um, to determine what we can use as a basis for what rate. Mm -hmm. And who decides on the rate? Currently, the system has had rates for, for many years um, for different levels that the area agencies have been using. Um, and a lot of times um, it's based on the assessments um, and but there'll be a few there will be a few shifts um, in the number of D's for residential um, that we've talked about before um, so when the modeling comes out these the the rates will be shown for people that are doing the modeling and um, it, it will all be described how it's going to change so for example residential um, or I should say personal care it's residential personal care it's really personal care services that are provided um, it'll be on a 365 day basis for DD and IHS um, they can have 52 therapeutic leave days a day that the state will pay for that's what it is for our institution on the state plan and from CMS, that's all that we can have for therapeutic leave days, uh, bed hold days, however you want to call them. Um, for ABD, they um, have a nursing facility level of care um, as their ability to get waiver services, um, their eligibility. And so they have 30 days of therapeutic leave. There will no longer be budgets based on 313, 185. It'll all be on 365 and it will be by the rate. So instead of having a total dollar amount and backing into the rates, what's gonna happen is based on the service agreement, you're going to be listing the services that are needed by the individual um, with their frequency, um, number of units, as well as the rate um, based on the level. Some respite, like respite, they don't have different levels. Um, and then you pick that rate and that's what you get. A little different. So thanks, Jen. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, Karen, I'm, I've got a question. I'm just not clear on, on one thing because we've kind of moved away from re-enrolling to rates. So I just want to make sure I understand um, if we have one location, but multiple services within that one location, do we need individual Medicaid numbers? No, not if that one location is your main, is your service location and you're providing services in the community, that one location would suffice as one provider ID. Good. Thank you. Thank you for the clarity. You're welcome. We do know that you, this is why this, we wanted to start this early because of these concerns that come up and how you provide services. Um, we wanted to make sure that we gave everybody the opportunity to be enrolled in the correct way um, and not provide a burden to you trying to complete applications and maybe they weren't needed. So if you have any questions when you start your enrollment process, please reach out. We have a multiple of people that are going to be available that can help you with these questions, um, as well as Conduit, myself, and the program area, the developmental service area. So I want to talk about federal screening requirements, because this is the basis, basically, for why the state does an enrollment process um, is that there must be program integrity screening, which is my area, um, and that there's a whole section of the application called Section 7 that is talks about exclusion and sanctions. Um, this section has yes, no questions, and if any of those questions are being answered with a yes, 
It is the responsibility of the provider to send in backup documentation regarding that. If you have not seen one of the applications, I suggest maybe going onto the website. We have an instruction um, manual for enrollment, and you can actually go through and you can see what the questions are. Um, so those questions must be answered. They have to be completed for the application to be a complete application. When those questions are answered, that gives us the um, insight to um, doing our federal screenings. Um, we have regulation regarding our in-state and out-of-state providers that if you are already, say, enrolled with Medicare, or if you're enrolled in another state Medicaid agency, that we do take those screenings that have already been done. But most of our providers enrolling in New Hampshire Medicaid um, are not enrolled in another program unless they're a Medicare provider. So we have to do those screenings as required and they look for those screenings when we go through an audit. The screenings are done on the provider group, as I said, the ownership and managing employee. It's the provider's responsibility to screen all of your employees that you use. And that means that you make sure that you have the proper licensure or certification and the OIG screenings are done on a monthly basis. If you happen to contract with any individual to provide covered Medicaid services, those screenings are still your responsibility to make sure that they're done on that person. And I go on to talk, because I use this for other entities, but also there are some entities that use outside professional groups. They have to also make sure those screenings are done either by the group or by the provider themselves. And the Rule of thumb is that you should perform these screenings upon hire of an individual or entering into a contract and every month thereafter until the provider no longer employs or contracts with the person. We are, you're required to search the employee or contractor name on the OIG list of excluded individuals and it's a website that you can do a search and you are to validate that they are eligible to receive funds from federal programs. That is the purpose of the screening. So that Karen. federal, I'm sorry. Hi, Karen, it's Anna Lake again. Hi. Um, just, I, I guess I'm looking for clarity because it feels like a lot of times when we um, have trainings for the area agency as a whole, the focus tends to be more on, on adult systems. So how does this apply to early supports and services with the contract providers um, that provide, you know, whether it's um, autism services or whatever, hearing and vision? Same. It's the same. So we have to, the, the provider, Medicaid provider, yeah. right, the vendor program contracting must. The person who is providing the services licenses and not screen an individual. Them. So Anna, if you have um, hired, if you have a contract or a, an agreement with an entity that provides these services for you, that entity is supposed to be screening their employees on the OIG exclusive list. But we also have to verify that the screening has- You have to ask them, are you doing your monthly screenings on your employees? And they have to be able to show you that they are. So it seems like it would make sense that that be built, some language be built into the contracts around that. I think you should. Most of our providers and our other side of the house um, do have it in their um, professional agreements that it is the contractor's responsibility to make sure the OIG screenings are done on their employees. Okay, thank you. Karen, this is Diane Volvik. Could you... Uh, um, give us some indication of what um, what are the criteria for excluding individuals or entities? Okay, have you gone on? Have you ever gone on the OIG website? I don't even know what OIG stands okay. for. Okay, I'm ESF. Of Inspector General. <laughs> ah, um, okay. So it's the Office of Inspector General, and what happens is 
these individuals or groups have been sanctioned by the Office of Inspector General or excluded that they are not to receive any federal funded monies. That means the entity or the individual. So it would be, say you, um, there was an RN that was excluded on this list, but yet that RN came and wanted to be employed as a personal care service provider. Well, if you check the OIG list, her name and social security number are going to pop up. And that means that it says right on the list that she is an excluded individual. So you actually cannot use that individual to provide services that are being paid by the Medicaid program. Or so, my, so my question though is what would cause a person to be excluded? Um, there was activity, whether they overbilled, um, false claims, um, okay. bill for services that weren't provided. Um, they were, we have um, other entities in other states that, because each state Medicaid program is different. So we had an entity that practiced in California and was convicted of a fraudulent activity and they were put on the excluded list, and then they tried to enroll and provide services in New Hampshire. I understand now. Thank you very much for clarifying. You're welcome. It's, Karen, not, tied, it's not tied into Corey. Karen, one more question, building off what Diana just um, mentioned. Okay, so what happens with contracted staff that are not enrolled as Medicaid providers because they just do um, contract where we just pay them? Yes, but it is ultimately your responsibility hiring that contracted staff that you ensure that they are not on the OIG list. I think, Anna, that that's because even though we're paying them, we're paying them with Medicaid dollars. Correct. Hi, Karen. This is Sudeep. I just have a question. I just wanted to go back to Frank's previous question. Um, when you said that, you know, about there might not be a need of, you know, applying for multiple provider IDs, I was just thinking, what if the vendor agency is providing both DD and ABD waiver programs? Isn't there a need uh, to be you know, applying separately for DD and ABD? No, that was the purpose, thank you for the question. That was the purpose of developing one service provider type of developmental services so that you wouldn't have to do multiple applications for different service groups. And Sudip, this is Jen. Um, you will be able to distinguish that by the billing code. So our billing, uh, the procedure codes and modifiers already distinguish between DD, ABD, IHS. So um, by just having one provider number, you can still provide all those services and bill for those. Uh, and the uh, billing codes will take care of themselves, which is really why we have them that way. Thank you, thank you Jim. So, um so is this something that area agency will have to re-enroll with you know, Medicare uh, provider you know, application? Yes. Thank you. Is there any more questions on the exclusions and the list and what the responsibilities are? My question on the exclusion is, does that information also tie into things like Corey, the, you know, the criminal record checks in New Hampshire? This is federal. This isn't um, state. So, so one's it, not connected to the other. It is not connected. Um, this is federal across the 50 states. So if something happens in one state, it is identified on this list. If, we, um, if you're trying to engage in somebody working in New Hampshire that maybe had a violation out in another state. And it's not necessarily current because it's not allegations, it's proven. It is current. Um, it is, we get a, it's a daily feed that goes into that list. It is huge, huge. <laughs> um, so these are all convictions, you're correct. Okay. So if there's an allegation hey. and they have not been convicted, then they may majority. not be on that list. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Hi, Karen. Just one more question, and I'm sorry. I, I oh. feel a little naive with this. No, I'd like everybody to understand it because I know it's a lot of information for some people. So go ahead. So, so, and I end, I understand that it's um, that we're paying them with federal funds. Yeah. If somebody that we're contracting with is yeah. not a Medicaid enrolled provider, how could their name possibly show up on the OIG as as being exempt? Well, we're hoping it doesn't, but they don't have to be an enrolled provider because the OIG list is all individuals and groups. So if the, the person named, um, like we have a case that was down in Massachusetts that a person was named in falsifying claims for transportation. It was an individual and the person was named into the False Claims Act, and the person is now excluded. They cannot receive any Medicaid funds, period. Because it goes by their Social Security number, the individuals. Okay, I, I think I get it now, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Karen, I, I, I just have a question around the OIG list. We, yep. Uh, currently, this is actually a, a requirement by the area agencies and as yeah. a vendor agency, we, we do the monthly screening and we do a quarterly attestation that this is being done. Yeah. Uh, however, the list, what we get from the state website, it looks specific to New Hampshire uh, and it's not a very big list if it were to be like a federal list. Correct. So you are doing the, Fed, the state of New Hampshire list, which Program Integrity has posted on the website of DHHS. Correct. You yes. need to be doing the federal list, which is the Office of Inspector General. Okay, so the list will change. Okay. Yep, you, you should be doing a bigger one. Okay? Thank you. All right, we're going to go on. So... This answers some of your questions that you've already asked, but if the provider finds that you have a sanctioned individual, a nurse, for example, that is now trying to work as a personal care service provider or be an enhanced family care provider, um, then you need to discon discontinue using this provider. As soon as you find out that that person is on the excluded list, you need to discontinue use of that provider. Only the individual or group can change their status on that list. Nobody else can intervene and change their status. It also needs to be immediately reported to the New Hampshire Medicaid Program Integrity Unit. And usually the information is just brief. You can send a secure email and you send it to our Program Integrity email box or you can mail it in um, to the Thayer building. And that you cannot continue using that provider. That is the process until that provider clears themselves or there are changes made that it was done in error by a wrong social security number. So Karen, uh, this is Jen. Let me just clarify that currently, this, this is what needs to happen for, um, all Medicaid providers now. This is not something that is a future thing. So this is something that has to happen now. So right. um, the area agencies, yeah. it's it's their responsibility to make sure that this is happening as well, or uh, anyone that's anyone that's enrolled as a Medicaid provider. This is current and has to happen. So if you are providing services to any of our Medicaid members, and even though you're not enrolled in Medicaid yet, you should be screening your employees on the federal OIG, Office of Inspector General list every month. Okay. So what happens after you get this enrollment completed? Now you've gone through all this, you've submitted all these forms and everything, and we've done our screening. You receive your welcome letter, you now have your new Medicaid provider ID. Your responsibility after you enroll is you need to keep the information current. Um, we have multiple providers who are delinquent in sending change of addresses, change in board of directors, they don't, you know, change in ownership, managing employees. 
Um, they're not submitting appropriate change forms for authorized representatives to have access to the portal. Um, all of these things will affect your ongoing day-to-day -day management of however you choose that you're gonna be paid for claims. And it's gonna affect if you wanna do eligibility checks in the system, but your authorized person is no longer with you and you didn't submit a change form to change that, then you have no way of checking eligibility of Medicaid on members. Um, if your board of directors, ownership, managing employees change, that is a huge fit, uh, effect because there are times when certain providers go through what we classify as a change of ownership. That change of ownership is supposed to be submitted to the state of New Hampshire within 35 days of that change. And that is a very cumbersome process for us to backdate and recover claims that were paid on a provider ID that's inaccurate. That is a PERM error for us, which is, um, that's our error rate with the CMS. Um, they do oversight and auditing of our enrollment activities. So we try to make sure that we instill upon our providers, it is important that you keep us abreast of any changes going on in your organization so that we can make sure we have the most accurate information. I know sometimes it gets missed and that's okay, but when we do revalidation, we send out a series of three letters telling you your revalidation is coming due. We have a volume of providers that we don't even know if they got those letters because we don't think the information we have currently in the MMIS is their active address at this time. So any service location address changes, anything like that really needs to be reported to us so that we can make sure that we update your files. Now, if you're not sure it's a reportable event, you certainly can call the Medicaid Provider Relations Center and they will walk you through that and help you understand. Also, if you are accepting 835 files, which are your remittance files, if you are, have checked off that you wanna get them and you know they come a certain day um, every time you submit claims, if you don't see those files coming through, and within two to three business days of the projected date you're supposed to get it, you really need to identify Medicaid provider relations because maybe there's something wrong with the, the way the information is being fed back to you or there's a delay at the um, MMIS system and they didn't get them out on the day they were projected to go out. So if those files are missing, you really need to call in and find out if everything's okay. You also need to maintain staff files at your provider locations. Um, it doesn't matter to me that you choose your main location and all of your um, corresponding information is there. Um, it's fine. It's however you as the provider wants to set up your staff files, but those staff files have to be maintained with all the current information information for that employee, including your screenings that you completed. And there's more than the LEIE, but I did not include them all here as I know each entity has different um, screening requirements. The last thing I want to say is for, you know, any questions, please reach out to the Medicaid Provider Relations Center. I've given you the number and the availability here reach out to um, Michelle Rosado, uh, Reba, Laurie Vashon, anybody within the program area, Jen, Sandy, um, anybody that you, know, you um, normally send your questions to. Um, if you're having any difficulties or struggling with the um, documentation or the MMIS portal, um, you know, just reach out to us and program integrity is we have an email box um, that you can certainly send emails to with questions, um, but don't try to do the uh, struggle with the application and the process that we're talking about 
um, without reaching out for some direction because we'll be more than happy to help you and try to get you through this process. That concludes um, what I wanted to talk about today. I know it's been a lot of information. Um, I know that you know this may be new for some people, um, but that's why we're going to provide this slide deck so that you have it as backup information. Um, and now we'll open it up and we'll take questions from the group. Karen, um, just wondering if you can include the email and the names of the um, specific people as well. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? When you email this information out, can you include yes. the names of the contact people you just provided, Michelle Rosado and all that? Yes. We will have a slide. I did not provide that. Um, I didn't have all the information right at my fingertips. So we will provide a slide of contact information for you. Yes. And I think uh, it, it'll be important to work through the liaisons, um, area agency liaisons, and um, plus the other people that, that Karen had mentioned, and, and we can get it to the appropriate people. I have a question about individual providers. Yes, ma'am. Um, so uh, my assumption so far is that for like our adult services, none of these, uh, you know, support staff or anything are licensed, you know, um, so we would be billing under the group. Yes. For the early supports and services, um, so for we also do outpatient. So all of our physical speech occupational therapists, they all have their own, uh, you know, non-billing rendering IDs. Um, are we going to be billing that those ESS services under a group ID, or are we going to be applying the rendering provider? ID as well as the group ID. And if that is the case, then uh, we have, you know, like educators, um, you know, certain hearing vision specialists that don't have their Medicaid IDs, are they going to need some kind of individual rendering ID? Are these services provided to school age children, Mark? No, so these are under three, uh, under three. early support and services. Okay, so you'd be billing those services as a group. Okay. And you would, you're contracting with those or having an agreement with those people to provide those services to your under three population, correct? Okay. Uh, yes. So Jen, how would you see that happening? I don't see that they need to enroll all those individual people because the group is billing for the service. Um, okay, Karen, you know, I, I, you know, we work directly with you and with your experience. So I will. Because that's how we do it in the school. Yeah, yeah, uh, yep. yep, exactly. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel here. Yeah, that is a, a large undertaking. Yes. If, if that's going to happen. And well, we and, and not, two. And, and we two, not do it at the school level right now. For those right. And, and two, we're not looking to lose providers in this, right. this um, process. So, yes. So this is Kathy Gray, Part C coordinator for the ESS program. Um, currently, the services for the ESS um, children, the zero to three, is a bundled build service. Correct. So I don't see needing to identify each one of those providers if the program or the area agency is registered as a um, Medicaid provider. That is correct, Kathy. We are saying that you do not have to individually identify those providers if you are going to be billing that one bundled service that is encompassing. We know by the code of the service that you're billing for what you're providing. This is Diane Boldick, also with ESS. Um, I have two questions. Are, are the ESS employees still subject to and do we are we required to do the oig um process for them and then the other question is will will the bundled rates will we still be using bundled rates and or will they be changing either the rate or the or the way we do that so yes you're still subject to the oig screenings of employees 
So if you have those employees that are providing a service, then yes, you must have them screened or you do the screening. Okay. Um, and as far as the bundled rate, I am not involved in that. That's Jen. And um, right now that is uh, the coding that we have in place for that service. So okay. Jen, that's your. Okay. And yeah. then the other question is, currently we built um, a variety of things under service coordination, one of which is intake. Um, and we're only allowed to build one service coordination a month. So if the area agency is doing the intake on May 2nd, and the first service winds up being at a different program on May 30th, um, and they're providing a service coordination as part of writing the IFSP, would only one of those be billable? And how is it determined which one gets to bill that? Diana, that's a very good question. Um, we are working with Kathy Gray and Dee um, and the area agencies working through the, the different tasks um, that are involved in um, not the DD, ABD, and IHS waivers, as well as um, case management. Um, and for in the ESS program, the EI, um, the family support, and uh, working through the funding that goes with each one of those uh, tasks and see what the delta is. So um, that's still a work in progress, but I appreciate you sharing that information. Okay, thank you, Jen. I, and I'd appreciate being apprised when you've made some, when you're making decisions or progress with that. Thank you. We will. This, this uh, meeting, um, we wanted to leave it for um, enrolling and letting Karen explain like the OIG, what needs to be done, what, what is behind it, why they're doing it, as well as our um, MMIS partner um, helping, uh, you know, send you to the forms and, and, and direct you through that, because this is a very important process and a change in our system. Starting next month, again, um, with, uh, with these meetings, we will start talking about that more and share as, as we come up with Great, information. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, Jen. Yeah. I, I want to add on that that um, in addition to the intake sort of duplication of service coordination that we run into with early intervention, we also have that happen with family support services. So the programs, the early intervention programs provide service coordination um, under ESS each month or most months with the child. Yep. But when the child also receives family support from the area agency, um, we don't have the opportunity to bill for that. Thank you for that. I will tell you, the group that we have does have two area agencies um, on it um, working with us. So I believe that that has been identified as a task under family support as well. This is Karen. I just want to go back to your NPI and your taxonomy. Um, I want to make sure that it is understood that you, if you do not have an NPI, you will need to get an NPI through the NPI website. Also, when we talk about taxonomy, that identifies you as a provider. So they have taxonomies out there that are community services, home health, um, you know, medical service clinics, there's all different taxonomies. So you will need to pick the one that appropriately identifies your service location for services. So if you're doing primarily community services, you could look at those types of taxonomies and select those. Um, that is part of the registration when you're going through for the MPI. And I might have just sort of moved right over that quickly but I wanted you to know that that could be a question um, during your NPI enrollment that you will be asked, asked to select a taxonomy and you should have a taxonomy to complete the group enrollment application. So any other questions regarding the process or um, I, the reason we wanted to get this out here now is we were hoping that this would give you providers an opportunity to start looking at the group application 
and you can certainly go ahead and fill it out. We have a workaround process. The new developmental services provider type probably will not be activated until October, but we can take your applications now and start looking at them um, for you know the um, any items that are missed or any issues that arise with them. Hi, this is Deborah Desenza. I have a question um, regarding um, contractors. So if we were to enter into a contract with, say, a speech language therapist, I understand we'd have to run them through the OIG, but do we have to get or do they have to have um, an NPI and Medicaid number or we just... We do not um, actually at this time identify rendering service providers in Medicaid. We identify ordering and prescribing. Um, we have those enrolled in our system right now is what they call an ORP. Um, we, you do not, if you are going to be doing the billing for her services, you need to maintain the information at your office regarding that provider. Hey, this is Kathleen. Okay, just to, thank you. Yeah. Just, um, we, it's referring. We don't require the referring. We do require oh. the rendering. Well, we don't ask them to enroll though. They don't have to put them on the claim. Okay. We do have some edits in the system that um, will pop up on claims. So if you have any of those questions regarding whether you should identify them or not, please reach out to the provider relations or to program integrity. Thank you, Kathleen, for bringing that up. I appreciate that. I have a question uh, similar on the same line. Um, so we, as, pro as provi service providers, we work with other um, entities uh, who provide um, something like a behavioral services. Um, and can they be, uh, go, can they go through this process and directly bill for their services for the specific individual we serve? They can certainly become a Medicaid enrolled provider, and they may be, but I'm not sure about the billing component. That would be Jen's wheelhouse. So are you, are you talking about like a specialty service, like an assessment or a consultation? Correct. Uh, or behavioral services. So, okay. uh, so if I understand, if I'm hearing this right, uh, it rates will, there would be a billing code and there would be rates assigned for different kinds of services, uh, case management being one, residential being other. So would behavioral services have a rate so that uh, when the service provider um, uh, provides that service, they can directly bill instead of having to go through the vendor agency? So um, when it comes to consultations and um, you know, assessments, um, any sort of medical services, they have to first go through um, our, our managed care organizations to see if, if the MCOs cover that service. Um, if they deny the coverage of that service for the individual, then we need to talk with our Medicaid partners here at the department to see if that is something that the MCO should cover. And if they should cover, then we would work with our, our Medicaid partners um, to um, uh, have a an agreement uh, or have them become a provider under the, the organization or not. Um, the waiver um, is provides a service if Medicaid does not provide it. So you, we will be sending out more information about that. We're working with Medicaid now um, to come up with a, a process to do that. But that's the way it's going to have to go forward. And so those providers may have to enroll with the managed care organizations um, who will then pay them. So. So I'll kind of piggyback off that one. So we do uh, therapy services. So we have a behavioral health staff that do, you know, direct therapy services. 
Um, we have a, our own Medicaid ID for a behavioral health group. Our providers are individually uh, registered as rendering providers with Medicaid and then also the MCOs. Um, so that's how we bill certain services. Then there are the other services, which I guess is what my question would be, uh, and it sounds like you're already looking into that. Um, you know, those behavioral services that aren't covered by uh, MCOs that don't have a direct therapy code, stuff like uh, training staff on behavior plans and things like that. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're working on that to see if that will be an MCO covered service or yes. if that's going to roll into the, the new IDs, right? Correct. I exactly. And that's where we rely on our Medicaid partners because they know what the managed care organizations are supposed to cover um, and they will push them to cover things if they're supposed to. If not, then we can have a discussion um, internally as to um, how we would be able to provide it on the waiver um, and, and what, what that code would be. Um, so as part of our modeling project, we, you know, we're looking at um, identifying gaps that we're not sure that we have codes for because we're not going to have a budget template where we can put stuff in different um, sections and then have it build under a code that we currently have. We need to identify everything that's provided and make sure that it's clean for an audit. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense to me. So, so like those behavioral services that you provide, we need to know what they are as opposed to just saying, oh, it's a specialty service and we're gonna bill it under X. Mm -hmm. So we just need to identify those things so that we are aware and we can um, work with CMS through the waiver in, in to see if we can cover it and how we can then cover it. So. Jen, this is Anna. Um, I'm gonna piggyback off Mark's comments. So a big gap with Medicaid coverage in behavioral consults and services are for children that lack the quote unquote correct diagnosis. Um, mm. Kids have behavior challenges. It, it astounds me that there's a diagnosis required to get that support for families. Keep in mind that this is, these are Medicaid services that are being provided and uh, it, it's the whole person that we're looking at. And, you know, I'm not a Medicaid expert uh, as far as um, the managed care uh, is concerned. And so there are codes for everything. You go to the doctors, there's codes for everything. Um, and so, you know, we're going to, we'll continue to work through these, but um, we do have to work in the system um, for direct bill that, that CMS requests us to do. And, quite frankly, that everyone else in the department is using, so. Okay, thanks, Jen. Um, I know you, some of you heard um, from a voice, uh, Kathleen Donovan. Um, she is the provider enrollment manager at Conduent. And I work closely with her um, on the enrollments. And um, they're very instrumental in the initial screening of applications that come in and alerting us if um, there's issues that they're seeing or they work with individual providers to try to get them through the process, um, whether it be the forms that they need to upload or there's information on the application missing. She has a great group of enrollment specialists that um, are out there trying to assist us in this process. So that number is at the bottom of this slide and it's Medicaid Provider Relations Center. And um, you may hear from her if there are some questions regarding uh, the applications coming through the system. 
Are there any other questions today regarding the presentation um, that we can clarify for you? Hi, this is Michelle Donovan from Living Innovations. Hi, Michelle. Hello. I noticed there are a lot of questions in the chat. Will they be answered in writing somewhere? So Jess, do you wanna, are you looking at the chat? Do you wanna give us some of those questions? I can't pull up the chat with my screen up. Sure, do you wanna cover them now? I've captured them in an email also. Okay, do you, are there any that, are there any questions that were in the chat that people would like us to um, cover right now? We still have some time if you wanna do that. Um, I see a few that we didn't get to touch base on yet. Um, <clears throat> I think we covered the, do we need to enroll each service location individually? You talked about that. Um, if we do our own billing, does that mean we will no longer be charged the 2% on contracts, which now go to the area agency? And when does this become effective? <clears throat> so Jen, they're talking about um, doing their own billing. Will they still have that 2% charge? That That's the, um, no, um, you will not have to pay for billing unless you hire a third party billing company to do your billing for you. And that price for the billing will be um, set by the company that does it. There are companies out there now that do it. Um, so it'll be kind of like a competitive kind of process. So there's not a set percentage. Um, I don't know who asked that, but it, is that on top of um, the 3% that you give to the agencies to oversee the budgets? From Daphna Teal, and I believe she meant to say that 3% you know, area agencies. Okay, okay, thank you, Suda. That's what I was, that's what I was wondering, but I wanted to ask. Would would you be able to share the third party billers or um, examples of soft vendor softwares, like what are currently being used? Um, there there are multiple um, methods being used. I'm not sure. Um, I looked at Kathleen. Do we have any idea of what is currently being used out there in the? system on providers, Kathleen? Um, as you say, Karen, there are many different um, softwares that are out there. And if you um, have a certain software that you're working with now, um, we can accommodate for almost all of them. Um, I haven't come across one that we couldn't accommodate for. When it comes to the trading partners, that's a relationship with you and that, um, that vendor or that contractor. And, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't venture to tell you which one to use or suggest or anything. We do have um, trading partners that are enrolled today. When you're talking with your people, if you wish to go that um, trading partner route, um, when you're talking to them, you, you should ask them if they're already enrolled in New Hampshire Medicaid. Um, and if they are, ask them for that um, trading partner ID so that you can um, include that in your enrollment. I would also like to just point out that the um, MMIS portal access enables you to do your, your billing yourself electronically right in the system, and you'll get that real-time adjudication, um, and it's, it, it is a simple process, but how you handle your, your relationships for billing is totally up to you. Thank you. You're welcome. So I do want to just review again about the case management only agency. Um, there is preliminary review done that it looks like that service is going to need to be licensed through health facilities. So we are going to try and get that decision final within the next week or so, because if that is what agencies will have to complete, then you will have to send in a health facility um, licensure uh, form for them to um, do your 
inspection and finalize a license for you to provide case management. This is only if that is the only service you are going to be providing. Karen, this is Erin Hall. A oh, quick hi. question in regarding licensing. So we currently have a licensing, a license through facilities. Yes. Will that one, um, precise, will be, will be good to use for um, this also? I knew that was gonna come up because I know some of you already do because you do dual um, case management. And that is a discussion that um, I had with Melissa uh, in legal. And we have not come to that final decision yet, but we're hoping that it can be the same, Erin. That, that would be nice. <laughs> Thank I, you. I'm gonna work on it. I will try. It's just a matter of having a, a license. You have a license, you can give us a number. It just, we wanna make sure it's for um, those who do CFI and do developmental services so that um, you wouldn't have to get to. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Karen, this is Jeb Curlot from Life Coping. Hi, Jeb. Hi, I have a question about, um, we have for um, CFI, we've already, well, Life Coping and the has enrolled with MMIS and we are billing through MMIS. Um, and so we've gone through that process um, with the getting the um, um, uh, well, NBI number and the trade agreement. Uh, I'm, my question is, is this to agencies that will be working um, with an in BDS um, for with the developmentally disabled, or is this also gonna to apply to all Medicaid providers, including the CFI providers? So all of our CFI providers, Jeb, are already enrolled, um, and they enroll as they wanna provide services. So this is strictly for the BDS population, so you will have to complete, if you want to do case management for that population um, and bill directly for it, you would have to have a new provider ID under developmental services. Okay, so then we'd have two provider numbers. We'd have one yes. for, this. okay. Yes. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Any other questions? This, this is Kathleen again, um, Karen. So that's a good example of where you would want, why you would wanna have the Medicaid ID on your claims if you're, if you're not going through the portal, but you're submitting them electronically otherwise. If you have that provider ID that's situated with that particular claim, then um, it will adjudicate much quicker and efficiently because you do have more than one ID. And also it will prevent you from having a call from program integrity when we are doing claims analysis. Um, because with that provider ID, we can actually see what you were currently reimbursed for under Medicaid using your provider ID and your MPI. Hey, Karen, quick question. Yes, Erin. Um, I don't see a choice under provider type as other. Um, we were concerned about that. So <laughs> what are, are there any choices there at all? that say other or we thought we looked that up though yeah i'm on it i'm on it right now and it's 099 is the code it says uh the closest thing would probably be not classified or unknown there you go not classified or unknown thank you erin okay so, so use that one we'll use currently unclassified or unknown uh, that is the category that you're going to be selecting as provider type right now. If you're going to be doing your application prior to the implementation of the new provider type, which won't be until October. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Karen. This is Carla with True Granite Service Coordination. Hi. You went on mute again. Somebody did. I'm testing out this space bar. I heard you can hold that down and use that. It did not work. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so I'm curious about the license form for case management. You guys said that it's in preliminary right now and you'll know something next week. Uh -huh. Is there any way to get on an email chain with that so we're up to date on what you guys determine? Yes, so um, Jess um, Kennedy, um, who coordinates these meetings, um, hopefully has an email chain. I saw quite a few email addresses. So okay. what we're going to do is when we are ready to provide the final guidance from the department, we will put it out there um, on our on the website as well as send it out by email. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. This is Diane. If, if an entity does their application now and uses the unknown category, do they then have to redo? How much of it do they then have to redo to change their category when the new category? We don't have to redo anything. We've already set it up in the system that um, once that application comes in with that, we do it behind the scenes for you once we actually have the provider type and specify. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And this is Kathleen again. Um, it would be helpful um, when you are um, uploading your documents to your application. Um, perhaps you could uh, upload a little note that says this is for the developmental services so that um, we can immediately just go through it all correctly as, as developmental services um, and not have to contact you for that reason. <laughs> Karen, did you want a few more of the chat questions? Sure, Jess, go ahead. Do respite providers need to be screened on the OIG list monthly? Oh, definitely, definitely. That is a hot topic right now in program integrity. So if you have members that are self-directing and they want to hire their own respite providers, they must go through a screening process. So it would be the agency's responsibility um, to do that if you're gonna be billing for that service. Will providers manage their own pending claims? Pending claims. Um, can whoever asked that question give us a little bit more what you're talking about? Ray, can you um, give detail on that? If a PA isn't issued, who's going to, base, you know what I mean? We're not collecting anything for it until a PA gets issued. That's correct. So my understanding, and, and Jen um, will um, chime in, please, is that there is going to be a mechanism set up for the service authorizations to continue to be entered um, by the area agencies. And that is going to be a later training down the road. And That's correct. That's correct, Karen. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. We are not um, ready for that yet. No, no, it, but it, it's coming. It's coming with MMIS. And, yes. Yes. and so area agencies will be um, uh, later on this year, will be uh, entering their own service sauce um, into MMIS. We call them prior authorizations in the BDS system, but in MMIS, their service laws. It's the same thing, it's just a different name. Um, so just so we have the same lingo. Um, and area agencies will be uh, responsible for putting up um, service laws for all services going forward for the individuals that they receive the um, Medicaid administrative rate for. So that is another process that is going to probably have to have an initial training um, yep. to the agencies um, and um, providers. So that will be coming down the road. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Jess. Who will bill private insurance for ESS before billing Medicaid as they're the payer of last resort? So the responsibility and program integrity, the responsibility is the providers. The provider that is providing the services for ESS needs to bill the commercial insurance 
receive a denial from the commercial insurance, and then submit the bill to Medicaid. And if you do not follow the process that we have written in the administrative rules, um, there is you know, repercussions that could happen if you do not get that denial from the primary insurance. Now, if you are seeing the child and it's an ongoing and it's not, you know, you, you check the insurance upon taking the child on and then the administrative rule, you want to check and see what your timelines are because if the service keeps going month after month, you probably don't have to check it every month. But there are there are certain timelines that are within the administrative rule that tell you how often you need to do that TPL check. Did that answer your question? Um, okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Um, Someone is asking, if we enroll as a non-billing provider, what is the process to change to a billing provider? Okay, so I need an example of why you would enroll as a non-billing provider. So that means you want to enroll to get a Medicaid provider ID. For what reason? Because all groups are going to be a billing provider. Only those non-billing individuals there's not going to be very many of them, I don't think, that you will be asking them to enroll as a provider because you're going to be paying them directly. So every provider is going to be a direct bill provider. They can choose to directly bill themselves or have a third party bill or bill for them. So if you use an individual who is not a group, it's an individual, and that individual provides a service, you're gonna be billing for that service, not that individual. So if you hire somebody to do respite, you're gonna pay that respite provider. Not, they're not gonna bill Medicaid directly. Hi, this is Kathleen again. Um, is it helpful to think about the fact that everybody's going to be enrolling and you're all going to be enrolling as a billing provider, um, whether you're an individual billing provider or a group provider depends on what you're putting in for your financial information. So if you're using your social security number, you would be an individual billing provider. If you're using your FEIN or tax ID, then you would be a group billing provider. And if you are already enrolled in New Hampshire Medicaid right now as a non-rendering provider, not a non-billing um, provider, um, then you would need to identify what ID you're enrolled under and, um, and we'd work with you on that. And as Karen's saying, she doesn't understand, I, I don't understand what, why you would already be enrolled as a non-billing rendering provider why that would be unless maybe you're say uh um so you identify why you're a non-billing rendering provider today in the hampshire medicaid and then we would be um we'll work with you as to what you have to do for this right thank you kathleen yeah any more questions jeff um yes um, with regard to the timing and rollout of the application and billing, could you please take into account many smaller providers do not have multiple support staff to assist in preparing the application, et cetera. And we are working 24 seven with DPH testing of staff and residents, managing residents in our stay at home model for LTCF and do not have extra time during this pandemic. I think they're concerned about the timing of um, so we, we certainly understand um, everybody has additional um, job duties that they're trying to perform right now. That's why we wanted to give this overview in September. So it gave you time so that you could go in and start because you can start an application, but it doesn't mean you have to sit and finish it with everything that you need. 
as long as you keep your application tracking number, which is given to you when you first start out in the application, you can go back in to that application and continue as you have the availability. Our goal was we would like to have as many have their applications started and working through the process so that we have an idea. I mean, we're trying to manage workloads too on our side. So we wanted this and Jen, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we were striving for January of next year. Is that way we were? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes. Um, we want everyone to start doing it because it is a process and um, and sometimes it takes a while to get applications um, in and people enrolled. And we now have, we have Kathleen um, with Conduit, we have Karen in the program integrity area and um, BDS staff, many of which are on this call um, that are um, at the ready to help you do this. Um, and so uh, we wanna make sure that it's a smooth process as possible and that we are giving you enough time to get ready um, to direct bill and, and have the appropriate time you need to either set up a back office if you want, however you choose, or to get that third party biller. Um, either way, you will be billing. You will be a billing entity. Um, so that's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing it now. And we want to um, work with you to make sure it's done. We don't want to wait until, you know, March and say, oh, well, we decided to do this, but you know, we want to do it now, get it done now. Um, and that way um, it's just off our plate and then we can focus on the other things that we need to finalize before the um, uh, July 1 start. And I will too say that, that I appreciate, you know, the um, collaboration with Conduit, um, our DOIT, MMIS staff, as well as Karen's staff um, to do this. Uh, we've been meeting through the pandemic, um, even though we haven't, we weren't able to meet with you, we did meet. And on those calls we had from Conduit um, and all the groups from different aspects of MMIS enrolling claims, everything to make sure that we're not missing um, anything as, as we put this in the system. So I appreciate their support as well. Thank you, Jen. Well, that's what we're here for. We, we want to help. So, you know, please reach out to any of us um, once we give you that contact list um, to try and support you and help you through this process. Anything else, Jess? We've got a couple more minutes. Um, this is Diane Martinez. Um, I have a quick question. Well, the question I have about um, it has to do with PDMS, uh, participant directed and managed services. Currently, we have one billing rate per month um, based on the total amount. Like if, they, if a person has some day service, they have some residential service, and part of their case management, it's all combined into one rate. And we usually bill that every month. Um, we don't have units, like we have 12 units a year, so everything's broken out that way. So if someone has a, um, they have so many hours a week with a residential vendor, um, would that vendor still submit their billing to us and then we bill it as one rate? Or would the um, vendor bill that separately as, a, as, a, as their own entity? Diane, uh, this is John. That's an awesome question. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so PDMS is not a service that is provided. It is a method of delivering a service. Okay. Um, so Sandy, I got it right this time. Um, so we're all learning people. I mean, everybody we're learning. Okay. So yes, thank it, you, Jen. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so there will no longer be a 112 billing. You will be billing under PDMS for the specific service that uh, will be rendered. So um, if it's day, if it's case management, if it's um, SEPs, um, CSS, whatever it is, it's you will be, they will be billing it. Whoever provides it will be billing that separately for those services as is outlined in their service agreement. 
So it will look differently. It will not be a blended combined 112th billing anymore. It's going to be actual billing based on what's provided. That's currently what we do. Um, we get a bill each month from the vendor, whatever vendor it is, and based on what they have provided for service, we take that and we bill it. We bill actuals from the Moore Center. Yeah. Uh, bill one twelve. So I guess what I'm saying is they're going to bill directly. They're not. It's not going to be one. It's not all going to come to one place and then be billed. Um, it depends. So if you're looking at a respite provider, Diane, respite providers will not be enrolled. They will be um, contracted by you to provide a respite service on behalf of the individuals that choose um, the delivery of the PDMS delivery. Okay. Um, so then you would bill that respite service. Okay. But if it's a, a day service um, that's provided by someone that's enrolled then they will choose to bill it themselves or have someone else, a third party bill or bill it for them. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate you bringing that up, Diane, because I think that is um, a very good point and a distinction of, of what is currently happening in the system and what will be happening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Phillips, then if I can add something to that, and I know this meeting is coming to an end and we have a ton to talk about. <laughs> our authorizations, when we have a PDMS person, we have the PA is put out under the provider ID of the area agency. Um, and so everything rolls up that way. So if we're talking about having a day provider direct bill for a PDMS, a, a service that's under a PDMS program, what, does that mean that the prior authorizations are going to have to be line items out on what providers are providing which services yes just like in traditional correct okay thank you yep so we're coming to the end of our two hours here um i want to thank everybody for your participation we had some great questions great conversation um as i said in the beginning Jess did get this um, to record for us. So for those that missed it, there will be a recording. Um, and also any questions that were not answered that were in the chat, um, we um, will put those together um, and send those out. Uh, give a few days, we'll do um, the PowerPoint as well as a contact listing and um, we will get that out to all of you that provided um, your email addresses in the um, invitation. Uh, I wanna say thank you to everybody. Thank you to the uh, department, to um, you know, the program area, um, Conduit, Kathleen Donovan. Um, we'll all be here to kind of help you through this process. And um, we appreciate you being on the uh, training session today. All right, thank you guys. Um, again, I appreciate it. And um, we'll be sending out specifics for the rate modeling uh, soon and um, we'll regroup next month. Have a good weekend. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, Jess. Jen, I'm gonna you. give you a call, okay? Anybody has any additional questions they want submitted? to the Bureau, just send them to me. Um, my email is in the chat and also was connected to this. So any more questions, let me get to the right people.